The question of whether there are any beliefs or desires common to all human beings is of little interest apart from the vision of a utopian, inclusivist human community, one which prides itself on the different sorts of people it welcomes rather than on the firmness with which it keeps out strangers. Most human communities are exclusivist. Their sense of identity and the self-images of their members depend on pride in not being certain other sorts of people, people who worship the wrong god, eat the wrong foods, or have some other perverse, repellent beliefs or desires. Philosophers would not bother trying to show that certain beliefs and desires are found in every society or are implicit in some ineliminable human practice unless they hope to show that the existence of these beliefs demonstrates the possibility of or the obligation to construct a planet-wide inclusivist community. In this paper, I'll use the term democratic politics as a synonym for the attempt to bring such a community into existence. One of the desires said to be universal by philosophers interested in democratic politics is the desire for truth. In the past, such philosophers have typically conjoined the claim that there is universal human agreement on the supreme desirability of truth with the further premises that truth is correspondence to reality and that reality has an intrinsic nature, that there is, in Nelson Goodman's terms, a way the world is. Given these three premises, they proceed to argue that truth is one, and that the universal human interest in truth provides motive for creating an inclusivist community. For such a community would be best suited to accomplishing our desire of discovering the one truth. The more of that truth we uncover, the more common ground we shall share, and the more tolerant and inclusivist we shall therefore become. The rise of relatively democratic, relatively tolerant societies in the last few hundred years is said to be due to the increased rationality of modern times, where rationality denotes the exercise of a truth-oriented faculty. The three premises I've listed are sometimes said to be necessitated by reason. That is, the, the premise is that everybody wants truth, that truth is correspondence and to reality, and that reality has an intrinsic nature. These three premises are sometimes said to be necessitated by reason, but this claim is usually tautologous, for philosophers who say that typically explain their use of the word reason by listing those same three premises as constitutive of the very idea of rationality. They view colleagues who have doubts about one or another of these three premises as irrationalist. I have a footnote about Nietzsche, James, and Habermas as people who are called irrationalists uh, for rejecting one or another or more of those premises. Degrees of irrationality are attributed according to how many of these premises the distrusted this the distrusted philosopher denies, and also according to how little interest he or she shows in democratic politics. In this paper, I'll consider the prospects for defending democratic politics while denying all of the three premises I've listed. I'll be arguing that what philosophers have described as the universal desire for truth is better described as the universal desire for justification. The grounding premise of my argument is that you can't aim at something, can't work to get it, unless you could recognize it once you got it. One difference between truth and justification is just that between the unrecognizable and the recognizable. We shall never know for sure whether a given belief is true, but we can be sure that nobody at the moment is able to summon up any residual objections to it, that everybody agrees that it ought to be held. There are, to be sure, what Lacanians call impossible, indefinable, sublime objects of desire, but a desire for such an object cannot be made relevant to democratic politics. On my view, truth is just that sort of object. It's too sublime, so to speak, to be either recognized or aimed at. Justification is merely beautiful as opposed to sublime, but it is recognizable and therefore capable of being systematically worked for. Sometimes, with luck, justification is even achieved. But that achievement is usually only temporary, since sooner or later, with luck, 
Some new objections to the temporarily justified belief will be developed. As I see it, the yearning for unconditionality, the yearning which leads philosophers to insist that we need to avoid contextualism and relativism, is indeed satisfied by the notion of truth. But this yearning is unhealthy because the price of unconditionality is irrelevance to practice. So I think the topic of truth can't be made relevant to democratic politics, and that philosophers devoted to such politics should forget about truth and stick to the topic of justification. Now I turn to Habermas. In order to place my view within the context of contemporary philosophical controversies, I'll begin with some comments on Habermas. Habermas draws his well-known distinction between subject-centered reason and communicative reason in connection with his attempt to separate out what's useful to democratic politics in the traditional philosophical notion of rationality from what's useless. I think that he makes a tactical error when he tries to preserve the notion of unconditionality. Although I think Habermas is absolutely right that we need to socialize and linguistify the notion of reason by viewing it as communicative, I think that we also need to naturalize reason. Habermas, like Putnam, believes that reason cannot be naturalized. Both philosophers think and that's a phrase from Putnam, endorsed by Habermas. Both philosophers think it important to insist on this point in order to avoid the relativism which seems to them to put democratic politics on a par with totalitarian politics. Uh, you could say, if, it ha if there's a moment of unconditionality, then you can't naturalize it. Both think it important to say that, the, that democratic politics is more rational than totalitarian fascist politics. I don't think we should say that, because I don't think the notion of rationality can be stretched that far. We should admit that we have no neutral ground to stand on when we defend democratic politics against its opponents. If we don't admit this, I think we can rightly be accused of attempting to smuggle our own social practices into the definition of something universal and ineluctable, because presupposed by the practices of any and every language user. It would be franker and therefore better to say that democratic politics can no more appeal to such presuppositions than can anti-democratic politics, but is none the worse for that. Habermas agrees with the criticism which post-Nietzschean writers have made of what Derrida calls logocentrism, and specifically with their denial that, quote, the linguistic function of representing states of affairs is the sole human monopoly, close quotes. So do I, but I would extend this criticism as follows. Only over-attention to fact-stating would make one think that there was an aim of inquiry called truth in addition to the aim of justification. More generally, only over-attention to fact-stating would think that a claim would make one think that a claim to universal validity is important for democratic politics. Still more generally, abandoning the logocentric idea that knowledge is the distinctive human capacity would leave room for the idea that democratic citizenship is better suited for the role of the distinctively human capacity. The latter is what we human beings should take most pride in and should make central to our self-image. As I see it, Habermas's attempt to redefine the term reason after deciding that, as he says, the paradigm of the philosophy of consciousness is exhausted, his attempt to redescribe reason as communicative through and through is insufficiently radical. It's a halfway house between thinking in terms of validity claims and thinking in terms of justificatory practices. It comes down halfway between the Greek idea that human beings are special because they can know, whereas other animals can merely cope, and Dewey's idea that we are special because we can take charge of our evolution, take ourselves in directions which have neither precedent nor justification in either biology or history. The latter idea can be made to sound unattractive by dubbing it Nietzschean and construing it as one more form of the same will to power which was incarnate in the Nazis. I'd like to make it sound attractive by calling it American and construing it as the idea common to Emerson and Whitman, 
the idea of a new self-creating community, united not by knowledge of the same truths, but by sharing the same generous, inclusivist, democratic hopes. The idea of communal self-creation, of realizing a dream which has no justification in unconditional claims to universal validity, sounds suspicious to Habermas and Oppel because they naturally associate it with Hitler. It sounds somewhat better to Americans because they naturally associate it with Jefferson, Whitman, and Dewey. The moral to be drawn, I think, is that this suggestion is neutral between Hitler and Jefferson. If one wants neutral principles and on the basis of which to decide between Hitler and Jefferson, one will have to find a way of replacing Jefferson's occasional references to natural law and self-evident political truths by a more up-to-date version of Enlightenment rationalism. This is the role in which Habermas and Oppel cast what they call discourse ethics. Only if one has given up hope for discourse ethics and for all other attempts at such neutrality will the alternative I'm suggesting seem attractive. Whether one gives up that hope should, I think, be decided, at least in part, on the basis of one's view of the sort of argument from performative self-contradiction which is at the heart of discourse ethics. I see that argument as weak and unconvincing, but I have nothing better to put in its place. Because I have nothing better, I'm inclined to reject the very idea of neutral principles and ask myself what philosophers might do for democratic politics apart from trying to ground this politics on principles. My answer is, they can get to work substituting hope for knowledge, substituting the idea that the ability to be citizens of the full-fledged democracy which is yet to come, rather than the ability to grasp truth, is what's important about being human. This is not a matter of what Oppel calls Letzbegründung, but of redescribing humanity and history in terms which make democracy seem desirable. If doing that is said to be, as Hoppel calls it, mere rhetoric rather than proper argument, I should rejoin that it is no more or less rhetorical or argumentative than my opponent's attempt to make discourse, to describe discourse and communication in terms that make democracy seem linked to the intrinsic nature of humanity. New section on truth and justification. <laughs> There are many uses for the word true, but the only one which could not be eliminated from our linguistic practice with relative ease is the cautionary use. This is the use we make of the word when we contrast justification and truth and say that a belief may be justified, but still not true. Outside of philosophy, this cautionary use is used to contrast less informed with better informed audiences and more generally past audiences with future audiences. In non-philosophical contexts, the point of contrasting truth and justification is simply to remind oneself that there may be objections arising from newly discovered data or more ingenious explanatory hypotheses or a shift in the vocabulary used for describing the objects under discussion which have not occurred to any of the audiences to whom the belief in question has so far been justified. This sort of gesture toward an unpredictable future is made, for example, when we say that our present moral and scientific beliefs may look as primitive to our remote descendants as those of the Greeks look to us. My grounding premise that you can only work for what you could recognize is a corollary of James's principle that a difference has to make a difference to practice before it's worth discussing. The only difference between truth and justification which makes such a difference is, as far as I can see, the difference between old audiences and new audiences. So I take the appropriate pragmatist attitude toward truth to be, it's no more necessary to have a philosophical theory about the nature of truth or the meaning of the word true than it is to have one about the nature of danger or the meaning of the word danger. The principal reason we have a word like danger in the language is to caution people, to warn them that they may not have envisaged all the consequences of their proposed action. We pragmatists who think that beliefs are habits of action rather than attempts to correspond to reality see the cautionary use of the word true as flagging a special sort of danger. 
We use it to remind ourselves that people in different circumstances, people facing future audiences, may not be able to justify the belief which we have triumphantly justified to all the audiences we have encountered. Given this pragmatist view of the function of the word true, what about the claim that all human beings desire truth? This claim is ambiguous between the claim that all of them desire to justify their beliefs to some, though not necessarily all, other human beings, and the claim that they all want their beliefs to be true. The first claim seems to me unobjectionable. The second claim, however, seems dubious unless it's merely an alternative formulation of the first. For the only other interpretation which we pragmatists can give to the second claim is that all human beings are concerned about the danger that someday an audience will come into being before whom a presently justified belief cannot be justified. But in the first place, mere fallibilism is not what philosophers who hope to make the notion of truth relevant to democratic politics want. In the second place, such fallibilism is not, in fact, a feature of all human beings. It is much more prevalent among inhabitants of wealthy, secure, tolerant, inclusivist societies than elsewhere, for these people are brought up to bethink themselves that they might be mistaken, that there are people out there who might disagree with them and whose disagreement needs to be taken into account. If you favor democratic politics, you will want to encourage fallibilism. But there are other ways to do so beside harping on the difference between the conditional character of justification and the unconditional character of truth. One might, for example, harp on the, si on the sad fact that many previous communities have betrayed their own interests by being too sure of themselves and so failing to attend to objections raised by outsiders. Furthermore, we should distinguish between fallibilism and philosophical skepticism. Fallibilism has nothing in particular to do with the quest for universality and unconditionality. Skepticism does. One will usually not go into philosophy, at least in Anglophone countries, unless one is impressed by the sort of skepticism found in Descartes' meditations. The sort of skepticism which says that the mere possibility of error defeats knowledge claims. Not many people find this sort of skepticism interesting, but those who do ask themselves, is there any way in which we can ensure ourselves against having beliefs which may be unjustifiable to some future audience? Is there any way in which we can ensure that we have beliefs justifiable to any and every audience? The tiny minority which finds this question interesting consists almost entirely of philosophy professors and divides into three groups. First, skeptics like Stroud, who say that Descartes' argument from dreams is unanswerable. For the skeptics, there's always an audience, the future self who is awoken from the dream, which will not be satisfied by any justification offered by our present possibly dreaming self. Second, foundationalists like Chisholm, who say that even if we're now dreaming, we can't be wrong about certain beliefs, certain of our beliefs. Third, coherentists like Sellers say that I quote Sellers, all our beliefs are up for grabs, though not all at once. We pragmatists who have been impressed by Peirce's criticisms of Descartes think that both skeptics and foundationalists are led astray by the picture of beliefs as attempts to represent reality and by the associated idea that truth is a matter of correspondence to reality. So we become coherentists. But we coherentists remain divided about what, if anything, needs to be said about truth. I think that once one has explicated the difference between justification and truth by that between present and future justifiability, there is little more to be said. Some of my fellow coherentists, Oppel, Habermas, and Putnam, think, as Peirce also did, that there's a lot more to be said and that saying it is important for democratic politics. Section 4, Universal Validity and Context Transcendence. <coughs> Putnam, Oppel, and Habermas all take over from Peirce an idea which I reject, the idea of convergence upon the one truth. Instead of arguing that because reality is one and truth correspondence to that one reality, Perseans argue that the idea of convergence is built into the presuppositions of discourse. 
They all agree that the principal reason why reason cannot be naturalized is that reason is normative and norms cannot be naturalized. But, they say, we can make room for the normative without going back to the traditional idea of a duty to correspond to the intrinsic nature of reality. We do this by attending to the universalistic character of the idealizing presuppositions of discourse. This strategy has the advantage of setting aside meta-ethical questions about whether there is a moral reality to which our moral judgments might hope to correspond, as our physical science supposedly hopes to correspond to physical reality. Habermas says that every validity claim, quote, has a transcendent moment of universal validity which bursts every provinciality asunder. In addition to the validity claim strategic role in some context-bound discussion. As I see it, the only truth in this idea is that many claims to validity are made by people who would be willing to defend their claims before audiences other than the one which they are currently addressing. Not all assertions, obviously, are of this sort. Lawyers, for example, are quite aware that they fashion their claims to suit the quaint context of a highly local jurisprudence. But willingness to take on new and unfamiliar audiences is one thing, bursting provinciality asunder is another. Habermas's doctrine of a transcendent moment seems to me to run together a commendable willingness to try something new with an empty boast. To say, I'll try to defend this argument, I'll try to defend this belief against all comers, is often, depending upon the circumstances, a commendable attitude. But to say, I can successfully defend this against all comers, is silly. Maybe you can, but you're in no more a position to say that than the village champion is to claim that he can beat the world champion. The only sort of situation in which you would be in a position to say the latter is one in which the rules of the argumentative game have been agreed upon in advance, as in normal as opposed to revolutionary mathematics, for example. But in most cases, including the moral and political claims in which Habermas is most interested, there are no such rules. The notion of context dependence has a clear sense in the sorts of cases I've just mentioned, in provincial law courts and in language games such as normal mathematics regulated by clear and explicit conventions. For most assertions, however, neither it, either the notion of context dependence nor the notion of universal validity has such a sense. For most assertions, such as Clinton is the better candidate, Alexander came before Caesar, gold is insoluble in hydrochloric acid, and the like, it's hard to see why I should ask myself, is my claim context dependent or universal? No difference to practice is going to be made by coming down in favor of one alternative rather than the other. Habermas puts forward an analog of this distinction between the context-dependent and the universal, which might seem more relevant to practice. This analog is what he calls the tension between facticity and validity. He views this tension as a central philosophical problem and says that this tension is responsible for many of the difficulties encountered in theorizing democratic politics. He thinks it is a distinctive and valuable feature of his theory of communicative action that, quote, it already absorbs the tension between facticity and validity into its fundamental concepts. It does so by distinguishing between the strategic use of discourse and what he calls the use of language oriented to reaching understanding. This latter distinction might seem just the one we are looking for, the one which lets us interpret the distinction between context dependence in universality and universality in a way which makes a difference to practice. As I see it, however, the distinction between the strategic and non-strategic use of language is just the distinction between cases in which all we care about is convincing others and cases in which we hope to learn something. In the latter set of cases, we are quite willing to give up our present views if we hear something better. These cases are two ends of a spectrum, at one end of which we shall use any dirty trick we can, lying, omitting the truth, suppress, suggesting the false, and so on, to convince. At the other end, we talk to, to others as we talk to ourselves when we are most at ease, most reflective, and most curious. Most of the time, we are somewhere in the middle between these two extremes.
My problem is I don't see that these two extremes have anything in particular to do with a distinction between context dependence and universality. The pure pursuit of truth is the traditional name for the sort of conversation which takes place at one end of this spectrum. But I don't see what that sort of conversation has to do with universality or with unconditionality. It is non-strategic in the sense that in such conversations we let the wind blow where it listeth, but it's hard to see that the assertions we make in such conversations presuppose something which is not presupposed in the assertions I make when I'm at the other end of the spectrum, the dirty tricks end of the spectrum. Habermas, however, thinks that unless we recognize, quote, that the validity claims raised hic et nunc and aimed at intersubjective recognition or acceptance can at the same time overshoot local standards for taking yes-no positions, we shall not see that this transcendent moment alone distinguishes the practice of just, practices of justification oriented to truth claims from other practices that are regulated merely by social convention. This passage is a good example of what seems to me Habermas's undesirable commitment to the logocentric distinction between opinion and knowledge, a distinction between mere obedience to nomoi to, social to the norms of social practices, even the sort of nomoi which would be found in a utopian democratic society, and the kind of fusse by nature relation to reality which is provided by the grasp of truth. Both the opinion knowledge and the nomos fusis distinction appear to Deweyans as remnants of Plato's obsession with the kind of certainty found in mathematics, and more generally with the idea that the universal being somehow eternal and unconditional provides an escape from what is particular, temporal, and conditioned. In this passage, Habermas is, I take it, using the term practices of justification oriented to truth claims to refer to the nice end of the spectrum I described above. But from my point of view, truth has nothing to do with it. And social convention, rather they're regulated by certain particular social conventions, those of a society even more democratic, tolerant, leisured, wealthy, and diverse than our own, one in which inclusivism is built into everyone's sense of moral identity. In this society, everybody always welcomes strange opinions on all sorts of topics. These are also the conventions of certain lucky parts of contemporary society. For example, universities, seminars, summer camps for intellectuals, and the like. Perhaps the most far-reaching difference between Habermas and I is that pragmatists like myself sympathize with the anti-metaphysical so-called postmodern thinkers whom Habermas criticizes when they suggest that the idea of a distinction between social practice and what transcends such practice is an undesirable remnant of logocentrism. Foucault and Dewey can agree that whether or not inquiry is always a matter of power, it never transcends social practice. So incidentally can Brandom. Uh, so this, you know, this issue comes up in the context of Brandom's work uh, tomorrow. Both would say that the only thing that can transcend a social practice is another social practice, just as the only thing that can transcend a present audience is a future audience. Similarly, the only thing that can transcend a discursive strategy is another discursive strategy, one aimed at other, better goals. But because I don't know how to aim at it, I don't think that truth names such a goal. I know how to aim at greater honesty, greater charity, greater patience, greater inclusiveness, and so on. I see democratic politics as serving such concrete, desirable goals, but I don't see that it helps things to add truth or universality or unconditionality to the list of goals, for I don't see what, I don't see what we will do differently depending on whether or not we make such additions. It may sound at this point as if the difference between me and Habermas is one that makes no difference to practice. We both have the same utopias in mind, we both engage in the same sort of democratic politics, so why quibble about the difference between whether to call utopian communication practices oriented to truth or not? Why quibble about the whole subject of the relevance of truth to democratic politics? <coughs> 
The answer is that Habermas thinks it does make a difference to practice because he gets to make an argumentative move which isn't open to me. He gets to accuse his opponents of performative self-contradiction. Habermas thinks that, quote, the universal discourse of an unbounded community of interpretation is unavoidably assumed by anybody, even me, who gets into any argument. He says, quote, even if these presuppositions have an ideal content that can only be approximately satisfied, all participants must de facto accept them, accept the presuppositions of communication, whether they assert or deny the truth of a statement in any way and would like to enter into argumentation aimed at justifying this validity claim. Uh, the, my experience of speaking in Frankfurt is invariably that at a certain point, Apple will accuse me of performative self-contradiction. And you know, this, is, this is the standard Frankfurt move, you know, sort of the, the basic strategy of the school. But what about somebody who is outraged, as are many trustees of American universities, by the social conventions of the better parts of the better universities, Places where even the most paradoxical and unpromising claims are seriously discussed and in which feminists, atheists, homosexuals, blacks, etc. are taken seriously as moral equals and conversational partners. I take it that on Habermas' view, such a person will be contradicting himself if he offers arguments to the effect that these conventions should be replaced by other more exclusivist conventions. By contrast, I can't tell the narrow-minded university trustee that he's contradicting himself. I can only try to wheedle him into greater tolerance by the usual indirect means, giving examples of present platitudes which were once paradoxes of the contributions to culture made by black female homosexual atheists and so on. The big question of whether anybody has ever been convinced by the charge, the big question is whether anybody has ever been convinced by the charge of performative self-contradiction. I don't think that there are many clear examples of such a change being taken to heart. If you tell a bigot of the sort I've sketched that he's committed to making context-surpassing validity claims to aiming at truth, he'll probably agree that that's exactly what he's doing. If you tell him that he can't make such claims and still balk at the paradoxes or the people at whom he balks, he will probably not get the point. He will say that people who advance such paradoxes are too crazy to argue with or argue about, that women have a distorted view of reality and the like. He will think it irrational or immoral or both to take such paradoxes and people seriously. That's why he doesn't think the university should allow them to teach, speak, and so on. I can't see much difference between the bigot's reaction to me and Habermas and Habermas's and my reactions to him. I can't see that anything like communicative reason favors our reactions rather than his. This is because I don't, I don't see why the term reason is not as much up for grabs as the term academic freedom or morality or pervert nor how the anti-foundationalist coherentism which Habermas and I share can make room for a non-recontextualizable, non-relativizable conversation stopper called performative self-contradiction. What the bigot and I do, and I think should do, when told that we have violated a presupposition of communication is to haggle about the meanings of the terms used in stating the purported presupposition, terms like true, argument, reason, communication, domination, and so on. This haggling will, with luck, eventually turn into a mutually profitable conversation about our respective utopias, our respective ideas about what an ideal society or university empower empowering an ideally competent audience would look like. But this conversation is not likely to end with the bigot's reluctant admission that he has entangled himself in a contradiction. Even if I should, by a miracle, succeed in convincing him of the worth of my utopia, his reaction will be to regret his own previous lack of curiosity and imagination rather than to regret his failure to spot his own presuppositions. Next section is about the Albrecht, an argument of Albrecht Velmers, whose sort of uh, 
associated with Habermas but differs from him in various interesting ways. I agree with Oppel and Habermas that Peirce was right in telling us to talk about discourse rather than about consciousness, but I think that the only ideal presupposed by discourse is that of being able to justify your beliefs to a competent audience. As a coherentist, I think that if you can agree with other members of such an audience about what is to be done, then you don't have to worry about your relation to reality. But everything depends upon what constitutes a competent audience. Unlike Hoppel and Habermas, the moral I draw from Peirce is that we philosophers who are concerned with democratic politics should leave truth alone as a sublimely undiscussable topic and instead turn to the question of how to persuade people to broaden the size of the audience they take to be competent to increase the size of the, re the relevant community of justification. The latter project is not only relevant to democratic politics, it pretty much is democratic politics. Hoppel and Habermas think that the demand to maximize the size of this community is already, so to speak, built into communicative action. This is the cash value of their claim that every assertion claims universal validity. Albert Bellmer, like me, rejects the convergentism which Habermas and Hoppel share with Putnam. But he nevertheless accepts their claim that our truth claims, quote, transcend the context, the local or cultural context in which they are raised. My problem with Velmer, Oppel, and Habermas is that I don't see what the pragmatic force of saying that an argument which, like all other arguments, convinces certain people and not others is a good argument. This seems like saying that a tool which, like all tools, is useful for certain purposes but not others is a good tool. Imagine the surgeon who, after unsuccessfully attempting to dig a tunnel out of his prison cell with his scalpel, saying, still, it's a good tool. Then picture him saying, after unsuccessfully trying to convince his guards to let him escape so that he may resume his position as leader of the resistance, saying, still, they were good arguments. My problem is intensified when I ask myself whether my truth claims transcend my local cultural context. I have no clear idea whether they do or not because I can't see what transcendence means here. I can't even see what the point of taking my assertion as making a truth claim is. When I believe that P and express this belief by asserting it in the course of a conversation, am I making a claim? What's the force of saying that? What does saying that add to saying that I am, to speak with Peirce, informing my interlocutor about my habits of action, giving her hints about to predict and con how to predict and control my future conversational and non-conversational behavior? Depending on the situation at hand, I may also be inviting her to disagree with me by telling me about her different habits of action, suggesting that I'm prepared to give reasons for my belief, trying to make a good impression on her, and a thousand other things. As Austin reminded us, there are lots of things I do when I make an assertion which can be interpreted as part of the give and take between me and my interlocutor. This give and take is a matter of roughly the reciprocal adjustment of our behavior the strategic coordination of that behavior in ways which may prove mutually profitable. Of course, if somebody asks me after I have asserted P whether I believe that P is true, I shall say yes. But I shall wonder, as Wittgenstein did, what the point of that question was. Is he questioning my sincerity? Is he expressing incredulity about my ability to offer reasons for my belief? I can try to straighten things out by asking the question to spell out why he asked. But he replies, I just wanted to be sure you are making a context transcendent truth claim. I'll be baffled. What does he want to be reassured about exactly? What would it be like for me to make a context dependent assertion? Of course, in the trivial sense that an assertion may not always be apropos, all assertions are context dependent. But what would it mean for the proposition asserted to be context-dependent as opposed to the speech act being context-dependent? I'm not sure how people like Habermas and Velmer, who've given up on correspondence theories of truth and consequently can't distinguish between a claim to report a habit of action and a claim to represent reality, can draw this distinction between context-dependence and context-independence. My best guess is that they believe that, in Velmer's words, quote, 
Whenever we raise a truth claim on the basis of what we take to be good arguments or compelling evidence, we take the epistemic conditions prevailing here and now to be ideal in the following sense. We, we presuppose that no arguments or evidence will come up in the future which would put our own truth claims into question. Or, as Velmer also puts it, quote, relying upon reasons or evidences as compelling means to exclude the possibility of being proved wrong as time goes on, close quote. If that's what it takes to make a context transcendent truth claim, then I have never made one. I would not know how to exclude the possibility that Belmer described. Nor would I know how to presuppose that no arguments or evidence will turn up in the future which will cast out on my belief. Relying once again on the fundamental pragmatist principle that any difference has to make a difference to practice, I want to know whether this excluding or presupposing are things I can decide to do or not to do. If they are, I want to know more about how to go about doing them. If they aren't, they seem to me empty. I can make my point in another way by asking, what's the difference between a metaphysician committed to a correspondence theory of truth telling me that whether I know it or will admit it or not, my assertions automatically, willy-nilly, amount to a claim to represent reality accurately, and my fellow Persians telling me that they automatically, willy-nilly, amount to an exclusion of possibilities or a presupposition about what the future holds. In both cases, I'm being told that I presuppose something which, even after considerable reflection, I don't think I believe. But the notion of presupposition, when it's extended to beliefs which the purported presupposer stoutly denies, becomes hard to distinguish from the notion of redescription of person A in person B's language. If A can explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it in her own terms, what right has B got to keep on saying, no, what you, A, are really doing is so-and-so? In the case at hand, we Deweyans think we have a perfectly good way of describing our own behavior, behavior of which Habermas approves, in ways which eschew terms like universal, unconditional, and transcendent. It seems to me in the spirit of Peirce's criticism of Descartes' make-believe doubt to raise the question of whether we are not dealing here with make-believe transcendence, a sort of make-believe response to a make-believe doubt. Real doubt, Peirce said, comes when some concrete difficulty is envisaged if one acts according to the habit which is the belief. Such a difficulty might be, for example, having to seize asserting and believing some relevant but conflicting proposition. Real transcendence, I should say, occurs when I say, I am prepared to justify this belief, not just to people who share the following premises with me, but to lots of other people who don't share those premises, but with whom I share certain others. The question whether I am so prepared is a concrete, practical question, whose answer I determine by, for example, imaginatively previewing various other audiences' responses to my assertion and my subsequent behavior. But such experiments in imagination obviously have limits. I can't imagine myself defending my assertion to any possible audience. In the first place, I can usually dream up audiences to whom it would be pointless to try to justify my beliefs. Try defending about be beliefs about justice to Neanderthals or Nazi prison guards, or about quarks to Aristotle, or about trigonometry to three-year-olds. In the second place, no good pragmatist ever uses the term all possible. He doesn't know how to imagine or discover the bounds of possibility. Indeed, he can't figure out what the point of attempting such a feat would be. Under what concrete circumstances would it be important to consider the difference between all the X's I can think of and all possible X's? How could that difference make a difference to practice? I conclude that Velmer's way of distinguishing between context-dependent and context-independent claims can't be made plausible, at least to pragmatists. Since I can think of no better way, I think we should ask why Velmer, Oppel, and Habermas think this distinction worth drawing. The obvious answer is that they want to avoid what they call the relativism which contextualism purportedly entails. So I turn now to what Velmer calls the antinomy of truth. 
the clash between relativist and absolutist intuitions. Toward the beginning of his essay, Truth, Contingency, and Modernity, Velmer writes as follows. If there, is irre- if there is irresolvable disagreement about the possibility of justifying truth claims, about standards of argumentation or evidential support, e.g. between members of different linguistic, scientific, or cultural communities, may I still suppose that there are somewhere the correct standards, the right criteria, in short, that there is an objective truth of the matter? Or should I rather think that truth is relative to cultures, languages, communities, or even persons? While relativism, the second alternative, appears to be inconsistent, absolutism, the first alternative, seems to imply metaphysical assumptions. Let's call this the antinomy of truth. Much important philosophical work has been done in the last decades to resolve this antinomy, either by trying to show that absolutism need not be metaphysical, or by trying to show that the critique of absolutism need not lead to relativism. End of quote. My problem with Velmer's antinomy is that I don't think that denying that there are the correct standards should lead anybody to say that truth, as opposed to justification, is relative to something. As far as I can see, nobody would think that the critique of absolutism leads to relativism unless she thought that the only reason for justifying our beliefs to each other is that such justification makes it more likely that our beliefs are true. I don't think there's any reason to think that such justification makes it more likely that our beliefs are true. But I don't think that's a cause for concern, since I don't think that our practice of justifying our beliefs needs justification. If I'm right that the only indispensable function of the word true, or any other indefinable normative term such as good or right, is to caution, to warn against danger by making gestures toward unpredictable situations, future audiences, future moral dilemmas, etc., then it doesn't make much sense to ask whether or not justification leads to truth. Justification to more and more audiences leads to less and less danger of rebuttal, and thus to less and less need for caution. If I convince them, we often say to ourselves, I should be able to convince anybody. But one would only say that it leads to truth if one could somehow project from the conditioned to the unconditioned, from all imaginable to all possible audiences. Such a projection makes some sense if one believes in convergence. For such a belief seems the space of reasons as finite and structured, so that as more and more audiences are satisfied, more and more members of a finite set of possible objections are eliminated. One will be encouraged to see the space of reasons in this way if one is a representationalist, because one will see reality, or at least the spatio-temporal hunk of reality relevant to human concerns, as finite and as constantly shoving us out of error and toward truth, discouraging inaccurate representations of itself and thereby producing increasingly accurate ones. But if one does not take knowledge to be accurate representation of reality, nor truth to be correspondence to reality, then it's harder to be a convergentist and harder to think of the space of reasons as finite and structured. Filmer, it seems to me, wants to project from the conditioned, our various experiences of success in justifying our beliefs, to the unconditioned truth. The big difference between me and Velmer is that I think the answer to, the, to Velmer's question, is a quote from Velmer, do our democratic and liberal principles define just one possible political language game among others, is an unqualified yes. Velmer, however, thinks, quote, A qualified no can be justified, and by justification I now mean not justification for us, but justification, period. End of quote. As I see it, the very idea of justification, period, commits Velmer to the thesis that the logical space of reason giving is finite and structured. So I would urge him to abandon the latter thesis for the same reasons that he abandoned Oppel's and Habermas's convergentism. But oddly enough, the reasons, these reasons are pretty much the reasons he gives for giving his qualified no. Velmer's central point in defense of this qualified no answer is one which I wholeheartedly accept. Namely, that the very idea of incompatible and perhaps reciprocally unintelligible language games is a pointless fiction, 
and that in real cases, representatives of different traditions and cultures can always find a way to talk over their differences. I entirely agree with Velmer when he says, quote, rationality, in any relevant sense of the word, cannot end at the borderline of closed language games, since there is no such thing as a closed language game. Close quotes. My disagreement with Velmer starts when, after a semicolon, Velmer finishes that sentence with, but then the ethnocentric contextuality of all argumentation is quite well compatible with the raising of truth claims which transcend the context, the local or cultural context, in which they are raised and in which they can be justified. I should have finished that same sentence by saying, but then the ethnocentric contextuality of all argumentation is quite well compatible with the claim that a liberal and democratic society can bring together, include all sorts of diverse ethnoi, all sorts of diverse local, cultural, social practices. Here's a way of summing up the difference between me and Velmer. We agree that one reason to prefer democracies is that they enable us to construct ever bigger and better contexts of discussion. But I stop there, and Velmer goes on. He adds that this reason is not just a justification of democracy for us, but a justification, period. He thinks that the democratic and liberal principles of modernity should pace rorty be understood in a universalistic sense. My problem, of course, is that I don't have the option of understanding them that way. Pragmatists like me can't figure out how to tell whether we're understanding a justification as just a justification for us or as a justification period. This strikes me as like trying to tell whether I think of my scalpel or my computer as a good tool for the task at hand or a good tool period. At this point, however, one can imagine Velmer rejoining, then so much the worse for pragmatism. Any view which makes you unable to understand a distinction everybody else understands must have something wrong with it. My rebuttal would be, you're only entitled to that distinction as long as you can back it up with a distinction between what seem good reasons to us and what seem good reasons to something like an ahistorical Kantian tribunal of reason. But you deprived yourself of that possibility when you gave up on convergentism and thus gave up the non-metaphysical Frankfurt substitute for such a, tri a tribunal, viz. the idealization called the undistorted communication situation. I agree with Velmer that, quote, democratic and liberal institutions are the only ones which could possibly coexist with a recognition of contingency and still reproduce their own legitimacy, close quote. At least, if one takes the term reproduce their own legitimacy to mean something like make its view of the situation of human beings in the universe hang together with its political practices. But I don't think that the recognition of contingency serves as a justification period for democratic politics because I don't think it does what Velmer says, namely, quote, destroys the intellectual bases of dogmatism, foundationalism, authoritarianism, and of moral and legal inequality. This is because I don't think that dogmatism or moral inequality have intellectual bases. If I am a bigoted proponent of the inequality of blacks, women, and homosexuals to straight white males, I need not necessarily appeal to the denial of contingency by invoking a metaphysical theory about the true nature of human beings. I could do that, but I might also, when it came to philosophy, be a pragmatist. A bigot and I can say, can say the same Foucauldian Nietzschean thing, that the only real question is one of power, the question of which community is going to inherit the earth, mine or my opponent's. One's choice of a community for that role is intertwined with one's sense of what counts as a competent audience. You know, do, do only Aryans count as a competent audience? You know, do only Christians count as a competent audience? Do only liberal Democrats count as a competent you know, So forth. The fact that there are no mutually unintelligible language games, the point Velmer insists on and which Davidson, I think, effectively argues for, the fact that there are no mutually unintelligible language games does not in itself do much to show that disputes between racists and anti-racists 
Democrats and fascists can be decided without resort to force. Both sides may agree that all they, though they un, although they understand what each other says perfectly well and share common views on most topics, including perhaps the recognition of contingency, the falsehood of fellow egocentrism, and so on, there seems no prospect of reaching agreement on the particular issue at hand. So both sides say as they reach for their guns, it looks as if we'll have to fight it out. My answer to Velmer's question about whether our democratic and liberal principles define just one possible political language game among others is yes, if the force of the question is to ask whether there is something in the nature of discourse which singles our game out. I can't see what other force the question could have, and I think so I think we have to rest content with saying that no philosophical thesis, either about contingency or about truth, does anything decisive for democratic politics. By decisive, I mean doing what Oppel and Habermas want to do, convicting the anti-democrat of a performative self-contradiction. The most that an insistence on contingency can do for democracy is to supply one more debating point on the democratic side of the argument, just as the insistence that, for example, only the Aryan race is in tune with the intrinsic necessary nature of things can supply one more debating point on the other side. I can't take the latter point seriously, but I don't think that there's anything self-contradictory in the Nazis' refusal to take me seriously, so we may both have to reach for our guns. Unlike Habermas, I don't think that disciplines like philosophy, linguistics, and developmental psychology can do much for democratic politics. I see the development of the social conventions in which Habermas and I both rejoice as a lucky accident. Still, I'd be happy to think I'd be wrong about this, that I might be, that I, I'd be happy to think that I was wrong about this. Maybe the gradual development of these conventions, that is, the gradual development of the social practices which make up the basis of liberal society, maybe the gradual development of those conventions does, as Habermas thinks, illustrate a universal pattern of phylo or ontogenetic development, a pattern captured by the rational reconstruction of competences offered by various human sciences and illustrated by the transition from traditional to modern rationalized societies. But unlike Habermas, I should be unperturbed if the offers currently made by the human sciences were withdrawn. For example, if Chomsky's universalistic ideas about communicative competence were repudiated by a connectionist revolution in artificial intelligence. I have a footnote saying that Davidson's argument in his article, A Nice Arrangement of Epitaphs, against the sort of MIT uh, language learning reconstruction of communicative competence in terms of Chomsky and fundamental grammar uh, seems to be, you know, this Davidsonian point that we don't really need the idea of mastering a set of grammatical rules in order to understand language learning seems to be being supported by connectionist programs and in artificial intelligence. Uh, this, I don't know whether this is true or not. I just put it in as an example of a change in the opinion of linguists, uh, an anti-Chomsky revolution in linguistics, which it seems to me doesn't, wouldn't greatly matter to philosophers or political thinkers, but I think Habermas goes out on a limb in you know, his attachment to Chomsky and his use of Chomsky's notion of competence as a sort of structural device for his own work. I, shouldn't, I should be unperturbed if Chomsky's ideas were repudiated, if Piaget's and Kohlberg's empirical results proved to be unduplicatable, and so on. I don't see that it matters much whether there are social patterns here. I don't much care whether democratic politics is an expression of something deep or whether it expresses nothing better than some hopes which popped from nowhere into the brains of a few remarkable people like Socrates, Christ, Jefferson, and so on, and which for unknown reasons became popular. 
Habermas and Oppel think that the way to create a cosmopolitan community is to study the nature of something called rationality, which all human beings share, something already present within them but insufficiently acknowledged. That's why they would be depressed if the offers made by Chomsky, Kohlberg, etc. were, in the course of time, withdrawn. But suppose we say that all that rationality amounts to, all that marks human beings off from other species of animals, is the ability to use language and thus to have sentential attitudes like beliefs and desires. It seems plausible to add that there is no more reason to expect all the organisms which share this ability to form a single community of justification than to expect such a community to unite all the organisms able to walk long distances or to remain monogamous or to digest vegetables. One will not expect such a single community of justification to be created by the ability to communicate if one takes the ability to use language to be, like the prehensile thumb, just one more gimmick which organisms have developed to increase their chances of survival. If we combine this Darwinian point of view with the holistic attitude toward intentionality and language use found in Wittgenstein and Davidson, we shall say that there is no language use without justification, no ability to believe without an ability to argue about what beliefs to have. But this is not to say that the ability to use language to have beliefs and desires entails a desire to justify one's belief to every language-using organism one encounters. It's not to say that any language user who comes down the road will be treated as a member of a competent audience. On the contrary, human beings usually divide up into mutually suspicious, not mutually unintelligible, communities of justification, mutually exclusive groups depending on the presence or absence of sufficient overlap in belief and desire. The principal source of conflict between human communities is the belief that I have no reason to justify my beliefs to you, and none in finding out what alternative beliefs you may have, because you are, for example, an infidel, a foreigner, a woman, a child, a slave, a pervert, or an untouchable. In short, you're not one of us, not one of the real human beings, the paradigm human beings, the ones whose persons and opinions are to be treated with respect. The philosophical tradition has tried to stitch exclusivist communities together by saying there's more overlap between infidels and true believers, masters and slaves, men and women, than you might have thought. For, as Aristotle said, all human beings by nature desire to know. This desire brings them together in a universal community of justification. To a pragmatist, however, this Aristotelian dictum seems thoroughly misleading. It runs together three different things, the need to make one's beliefs coherent, the need for the respect of one's peers, and curiosity. We pragmatists think that the reason people try to make their beliefs coherent is not that they love truth, but because they can't help doing so. Our minds can no more stand in coherence than our brains can stand whatever the neurochemical substrate of such coherence may be. Just as our neural networks are presumably both constrained and in part constructed by something like the algorithms used in parallel distributed processing of information by computer programmers, so our minds are constrained by the need to tie our beliefs and desires together into a reasonably perspicuous whole. That's why we can't, in James's unhappy expression, will to believe, believe what we like regardless of what else we believe. It's why, for example, we have such a hard time keeping our religious beliefs in a separate compartment from our scientific ones and in isolating our respect for democratic institutions from our contempt for many or most of our fellow voters. The need to make one's beliefs coherent is, for reasons familiar from Hegel, Mead, and Davidson, not separable from the need for the respect of our peers. We have as hard a time tolerating the thought that everybody but ourselves is out of step as we do the thought that we believe both P and not P. We need the respect of our peers because we cannot trust our own beliefs nor maintain our self-respect unless we're fairly sure that our conversational interlocutors agree among themselves on such propositions as, he's not crazy, he's one of us, he may have strange beliefs on some subjects, but he's basically sound, and so on.
This interpenetration of the need to make one's beliefs coherent among themselves and the need to make them coherent with most of those of one's peers results from the fact that, as Wittgenstein said, to imagine a form of human life, we have to imagine agreement in judgments as well as in meanings. Davidson brings out the considerations which support Wittgenstein's insight when he says, quote, the ultimate source of both objectivity and communication is the triangle that, by relating speaker, interpreter, and the world, determines the contents of thought and speech. You would not know what you believed, nor have any beliefs, unless your belief had a place in a network of beliefs and desires, but that network would also not exist were you and others unable to pair off features of your non-human environment with assent to your utterances by other language users, utterances caused, as are yours, by those very features. The difference between the use which Davidson and I would like to make of Hegel's and Mead's realization that ourselves are dialogical all the way down, that there is no private core on which to build, and the use which Hobble and Habermas, Hobble and Habermas make of this point can be exhibited by looking at the sentence immediately following the one I just quoted from Davidson. Davidson continues, given this source, that is given that the source of both objectivity and communication is this triangle, there is no room for a relativized concept of truth. Davidson's point is that the only sort of philosopher who would take seriously the idea that truth is relative to a context, and particularly to a choice between human communities, is one who thinks that he or she can contrast being in touch with a human community with being in touch with reality. But Davidson's point about there being no language without triangulation means that this contrast can't be drawn. You can't have any language or any beliefs without being in touch with both a human community and non-human reality. There's no possibility of agreement without truth, nor of truth without agreement. Most of our beliefs must be true, Davidson says, because an description to a person of mostly false beliefs would mean either that we had mistranslated the person's marks and noises, or that she didn't, in fact, have any beliefs, was not, in fact, speaking a language. Most of our beliefs must be justified in the eyes of our peers for a similar reason. If they were not justified, if our peers could not attribute to us a largely coherent web of beliefs and desires, they would have to conclude that they had either misunderstood us, sorry, they would have to conclude either that they had misunderstood us or that we did not speak their language. Coherence, truth, and community go together, not because truth is to be defined in terms of coherence rather than correspondence, in terms of social practice rather than in terms of coping with non-human forces, but simply because to ascribe a belief is automatically to ascribe a place in a largely coherent set of mostly true beliefs. But to say that there's no contact via belief and desire with reality, no truth without community, is as yet to say nothing about what sort of community is in question. A radically exclusivist community made up of only the priests or the nobles or the males or the whites is quite as good as any other sort of community for Davidsonian purposes. This is the difference between what Davidson thinks you can get out of reflection on the nature of discourse and what Oppel and Habermas think you can get out of it. The latter philosophers think that you can get something more out of such reflection than the fact that there are neither beliefs nor persons nor truth without justification in the eyes of a community. They think you can get an argument in favor of the inclusivist project, an argument which says that people who resist this project involve themselves in performative self-contradictions. By contrast, Davidson thinks that any community of justification will do to make you a language user and a believer no matter how distorted Oppel and Habermas take communication within that community to be. From Davidson's point of view, philosophy of language runs out before we reach the moral imperatives which make up Hobbes, Op, Oppel's and Habermas' discourse ethics. Oppel and Habermas run together the need for coherence and for justification, which is required if one is to use language at all, and a commitment to what they call universal validity, a commitment which can only be consistent of consistently acted upon by aiming at the sort of domination-free communication which is impossible as long as there are human communities which remain exclusivist. <laughs>
Davidson and I have no use for the claim that any communicative action contains a claim to universal validity because this so-called presupposition seems to us to have no role to play in the explanation of linguistic behavior. It does, to be sure, play a part in the explanation of the behavior, linguistic and other, of a small minority of human beings, those who belong to the liberal, universalistic, inclusivist tradition of the European Enlightenment. But this tradition, to which Davidson and I are as much attached as Oppel and Habermas, derives no support from reflection on discourse as such. We language users who belong to this minority tradition are morally superior to those who don't, but those who don't are no less coherent in their use of language. Hoppel and Habermas invoke the presupposition of universal validity to get from a commitment to justification to a willingness to submit one's beliefs to the inspection of any and every language user, even a slave, even a black, even a woman. They see the desire for truth construed as the desire to claim universal validity as the desire for universal justification. But as I see it, they're inferring invalidly from you can't use language without invoking a consensus within a community of other language users to you can't use language consistently without enlarging that community to include all users of language. Because I see this inference as invalid, I think that the only thing which can play the role in which Aristotle, Peirce, Oppel, and Habermas have cast the desire for knowledge, and thus for truth, is curiosity. I use this term to mean the urge to expand one's horizons of inquiry in all areas, ethical as well as logical and physical, so as to encompass new data, new hypotheses, new terminologies, and the like. This urge brings cosmopolitanism and democratic politics in its train. The more curiosity you have, the more interest you will have in talking to foreigners, infidels, and anybody else who claims to know something you don't know to have some ideas you have not yet had. Section 6, Communicating or Educating. If one sees the desire and possession of both truth and justification as inseparable from using language, while still resisting the thought that this desire can be used to convict members of exclusivist human communities of performative self-contradiction, then one will see inclusivist communities as based on contingent human development, such as the twitchy curiosity of the sort of eccentrics we call intellectuals, the desire for intermarriage beyond tribal or caste boundaries produced by erotic obsession, the need to trade across such boundaries produced by lack of, for example, salt or gold within one's own territory, the possession of enough wealth, security, education, and independence so that one's self-respect no longer depends upon membership in an exclusivist community, e.g. on not being an infidel or a slave or a woman, and the like. The increased communication between previously exclusivist communities produced by such contingent human developments may gradually create universality, but I can't see any sense in which it recognizes a previously existent universality. Philosophers like Habermas, who worry about the anti-enlightenment overtones of the views they call contextualist, think that since justification is an obviously context-relative notion, one, one justifies to a given audience, and the same justification won't work for all audiences, it endangers the ideal of human fraternity. Habermas regards contextualism as only the flip side of logocentrism. He sees contextualists as negative metaphysicians infatuated by diversity, and says that, quote, the metaphysical priority of unity above plurality and the contextualist priority of plurality above unity are secret accomplices. The, the, the idea is that uh, postmoderns in the tradition of Nietzsche, including me uh, for these purposes, are uh, plurality freaks in the same way that the Western metaphysical tradition condemned by Heidegger and Derrida were unity freaks whereas Habermas is neither a unity freak nor a plurality freak, but just right. <laughs> I agree with Habermas that it's as pointless to prize diversity as to prize unity, but I disagree with him that we can use the pragmatics of communication to do the job which metaphysicians hope to achieve by appealing to the Platonian one or to the transcendental structure of self-consciousness. My reasons for disagreement are those offered by Walzer, McCarthy, Ben Habib, Velmer, and others. Reasons nicely summed up in an article by Michael Kelly that I cite in the footnote. Uh, 
Habermas argues for the thesis that, quote, the unity of reason only remains perceptible in the plurality of its voices, as the possibility and principle of passing from one language to another, a passage that, no matter how occasional, is still comprehensible. This possibility of mutual understanding, which is now guaranteed only procedurally and is realized only transitorily, forms the background for the existing diversity of those who encounter one another even when they fail to understand one another. I agree with Habermas against Lyotard, Foucault, and others that there are no incommensurable languages, that any language can be learned by one who is able to use any other language, that Davidson is right in denouncing the very idea of a conceptual scheme. But I disagree with him about the relevance of this point to the utility of the ideas of universal validity and objective truth. Habermas says that, quote, what the speaker here and now in a given context asserts as valid transcends according to the sense of his claim all context-dependent, merely, standard, merely local standards of validity. As I said before, I can't see what transcends means here. If it means that he's claiming to say something true, then the question is whether it makes any difference whether you say that a sentence S is true or whether you simply offer a justification for it by saying, here are my reasons for believing S. Habermas thinks there's a difference because he thinks that when you assert S, you claim truth, you claim truth, you claim to represent the real, and that reality transcends context. I quote, with the concept of reality to which every representation necessarily refers, we presuppose something transcendent. Here, in my view, is where the notion of representation raises its ugly head in Habermas and offers us a reason for you know, never, never saying that sentences represent reality. Habermas tends to take for granted that truth claims are claims to represent accurately and to be suspicious of those who, like Davidson and myself, give up on the notion of linguistic representation. He follows Sellers in being a coherentist rather than a skeptic or a foundationalist, but he's dubious about the move I want to make from coherentism to anti-representationalism. He commends Peirce over Saussure because Peirce quote, examines expressions from the point of view of their possible truth and at the same time from that of their communicability. He goes on to say, quote, from the perspective of its capacity for being true, an assertoric sentence stands in an epistemic relation to something in the world. It represents a state of affairs. At the same time, from the perspective of its employment in a communicative act, it stands in a relation to a possible interpretation by a language user. It's suitable for the transmission of information. My own view, which I take from Davidson, is that you can give up the notion of an epistemic relation to something in the world and just rely on the ordinary causal relations which bind utterances together with the utterer's environments. The idea of representation on this view adds nothing to the notion of transmission of information, or more exactly, it adds nothing to the notion of taking part in the discursive practice of justifying one's assertions. Habermas sees Putnam as, like himself, defending a third position over against the metaphysics of unity on the one hand, and people like me, the enthusiasts for incommensurability, on the other. He, he thinks I'm an enthusiast for incommensurability. He defines this third position as, quote, the humanism of those who continue the Kantian tradition by seeking to use the philosophy of language to save a concept of reason that is skeptical and post-metaphysical. Putnam and Habermas have offered similar criticisms of my attempt to get rid of a specifically epistemic concept of reason, the concept according to which one is rational only if one tries to represent reality accurately, and to replace it by the purely moral idea of solidarity. My central disagreement with both Habermas and Putnam is whether, <coughs> sorry, is over the question of whether the regulative ideas of undistorted communication or accurate representation of reality can do any more for the ideals of the French Revolution than the bare context-dependent notion of justification. Some people care about defending their assertions only to a few people, and some care, or say they care, about defending their assertions to everyone. <coughs> 
I'm not thinking here of the distinction between specialized technical discourse and non-technical discourse. Rather, the distinction I want is the one between people who want to defend their views to all people who share certain attributes. For example, devotion to the ideals of the French Revolution or membership in the Aryan race, and those who say they want to justify their view to every actual and possible language user. There are certainly people who say that the latter is what they want, but I'm not sure they really mean it. Do they want to justify their views to language users who are four years old? Well, perhaps they do in the sense that they would like to educate four-year-olds to the point at which they could appreciate the arguments for and against views in question. Do they want to justify them to intelligent but convinced Nazis, people who believe that the first thing to find out is whether the view under discussion is tainted by the Jewish ancestry of its inventors or propounders? Well, perhaps they do in the sense that they would like to convert these Nazis into people who have doubts about the advisability of a Jew-free Europe and the infallibility of Hitler, and therefore are more or less willing to listen to arguments for positions associated with Jewish thinkers. But in both cases, what they want seems to me best described not as wanting to justify their view to everybody, but as wanting to create an audience to whom they would have a sporting chance of justifying their view. Let me use the distinction between arguing with people and educating people to abbreviate the distinction I've just drawn. The distinction between proceeding on the assumption that people will follow your arguments and knowing they, that they cannot but hoping to alter them so that they can. If all education were a matter of argument, this distinction would collapse. But unless one broadens the term argument beyond recognition, a lot of education is not. In particular, a lot of it is simple appeal to sentiment. The distinction between such appeal and argument is fuzzy, but I take it nobody would say that making an unregenerate Nazi watch films of the opening of the concentration camps or making her read the diary of Anne Frank counts as arguing with her. People interested in democratic politics both cherish the ideal of human fraternity and cherish the idea of the universal availability of education. When asked about the education we have in mind, we often say that it is education in critical thinking, in the ability to talk over the pros and cons of any view. We oppose critical thinking to ideology and say that we oppose ideological education of the sort which the Nazis inflicted on German youth. But we thereby leave ourselves wide open to Nietzsche's scornful suggestion that we are simply inculcating our own ideology, the ideology of what he calls Socratism. The issue between me and Habermas, I think, boils down to a disagreement about what to say to Nietzsche at this point. I should reply to Nietzsche by conceding that there is no non-local, non-contextual way to draw the distinction between ideological education and non-ideological education, because there's nothing to say to my use of the term reason that could not be replaced by the way we wet Western liberals, the heirs of Socrates and the French Revolution, conduct ourselves. I agree with McIntyre and Michael Kelly that all reasoning, both in physics and ethics, is tradition-bound. Habermas, Habermas thinks this an unnecessary concession, and more generally thinks that my cheerful ethnocentrism can be avoided by thinking through what he calls the symmetrical structure of perspectives built into every speech situation. The issue between Habermas and myself thus comes to a head when he takes up my suggestion that we drop the notions of rationality and objectivity and instead just discuss the kind of community we want to create. He paraphrases this suggestion by saying that I want to treat the aspiration for objectivity as, quote, simply the desire for as much intersubjective agreement as possible, namely the desire to expand the referent of for us to the greatest possible extent. Habermas then paraphrases one of Putnam's objections to me by asking, quote, can we explain the possibility of the critique and self-critique of established practices of justification if we do not take the idea of the expansion of our interpreted horizon seriously as an idea, and if we do not connect this idea with the intersubjectivity of an agreement that allows precisely for the distinction between what is current for us and what is current for them. 
Habermas enlarges on this point by saying, quote, the merging of interpretive horizons does not signify an assimilation to us. Rather, it must mean a convergence steered through learning of our perspective and their perspective, no matter whether they or we or both sides have to reformulate established practices of justification to a greater or lesser extent. For learning itself belongs neither to us or to them. Both sides are caught up on it in the same way. Even in the most difficult processes of reaching understanding, all parties appeal to the common reference point of a possible consensus, even if this reference point is projected in each case from within their own contexts. For although they may be interpreted in various ways and applied according to different criteria, concepts like truth, rationality, or justification play the same grammatical role in every linguistic community. End of quote. The nub of the argument is, I think, a disagreement about how much help for democratic politics can be gotten out of what Habermas here calls grammar. As I said earlier, I think that all we can get out of the grammar of the words true and rational is the same as what we get out of a rather thin idea of justification. This thin idea is the one we get when we answer the question, where does the line come between causing people to adjust their behavior by persuasion, by working on their beliefs and desires, and doing so by other means? Unlike Foucault and some others, I think it's both possible and important to draw a line here. I don't think it helpful to extend the term violence as widely as Foucault extended it. Whatever we're doing when we make Nazis look at pictures of concentration camp survivors, it isn't violence any more than it was violence to educate the Hitler youth to believe the Jews were worthless vermin. The inevitable fuzziness of the line between persuasion and violence causes problems, however, when we come to the question of education. We're reluctant to say that the Nazis used persuasion on the Hitler youth since we have two criteria of persuasion. One is simply using words rather than blows or other forms of physical pressure. One can imagine with a bit of distortion of history that in this sense only persuasion was employed on the Hitler youth. The second criterion of persuasion includes abstention from words like stop asking the, these stupid questions about whether there aren't some good Jews, questions which make me doubt your Aryan consciousness and ancestry, or the Reich will find another use for you. Those are not blows, but one might say it isn't exactly persuasion either. It's, you know, threats or something, you know, something that doesn't quite deserve the name persuasion. Uh, another example is uh, abstention from not assigning Der Sturmer to one student. Unsocratic methods of this latter sort are the kind which Habermas would say do not respect the symmetrical relationships of participants in discourse. Habermas clearly thinks that there's something in the grammar of concepts like truth, rationality, and justification which tell us not to use methods of the latter sort. He would presumably grant that the use of such words is language use, but he needs a category of distorted language use, or distorted communication, to explain that it is, so to speak, ungrammatical language use. Immediately after the passage I quoted about grammar, Habermas says, quote, all languages offer the possibility of distinguishing what is true and what we hold to be true. The supposition of a common objective world is built into the pragmatics of every single linguistic usage, and the dialogue roles of every speech situation enforce a symmetry in participant perspective. A bit later he says, quote, from the possibility of reaching understanding linguistically, we can read off a concept of situated reason that is given voice in validity claims that are both context-dependent and transcendent. He then approvingly quotes Putnam as saying, reason is in this sense both imminent, not to be found outside of concrete language games and institutions, and transcendent, i.e. a regulative idea that we use to criticize the conduct of all activities and institutions. <laughs> 
It seems to me that the regulative ideal that we, we wet liberals, we heirs of the Enlightenment, we Socrates, most frequently use to criticize the conduct of various conversational partners is the concept of needing education in order to outgrow their primitive fears, hatreds, and superstitions. This is the concept the victorious Allied armies used when they set about re-educating the citizens of occupied Germany and Japan. It's also the one which was used by American school teachers who had read Dewey and were concerned to get students to think scientifically and rationally about such matters as the origin of the species and sexual behavior. That is, to get the students to read Darwin and Freud without disgust or incredulity. It is a concept which I, like most Americans who teach humanities or social science in colleges and universities, use when we hope that the students who enter as bigoted religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. What's the relation of this idea to the regulative idea of reason which Putnam believes to be transcendent and which Habermas believes to be discoverable within the grammar of concepts ineliminable from our description of the making of assertions? The answer to that question depends upon how much the re-education of Nazis and fundamentalists has to do with merging interpretive horizons and how much with replacing such horizons. The fundamentalist parents of my fundamentalist students think that the entire liberal establishment is engaged in a conspiracy. Had they read Habermas, these people would say that the typical communication situation in American college classrooms, or at least my classroom, is no more Herrschaftsfrei, no more domination-free than that in the Hitler Youth Camp. These parents have a point. Their point is that we liberal teachers no more feel in a symmetrical communication situation when we talk with our fundamentalist students than do kindergarten teachers with their students. In both college classrooms and kindergartens, it is equally difficult for the teachers to feel that what is going on is what Habermas calls a convergence steered through learning of our perspective and their perspective, no matter whether they or we or both sides have to reformulate established practices of justification to a greater or lesser extent. When we American college teachers encounter religious fundamentalists, we do not consider the possibility of reformulating our own practices of justification so as to give more authority to the weight of the Christian scripture, more weight to the authority of the Christian scriptures. Instead, we do our best to convince these persons of the benefits of secularization. We assign, for example, first-person accounts of growing up homosexual to our homophobic students for the same reasons that German school teachers in the post-war period assigned the diary of Anne Frank. Putnam and Habermas can rejoin that we teachers do our best to be Socratic, to get our job of re-education, secularization, and liberalization done by conversational exchange. That's true up to a point. But what about assigning books like Black Boy, The Diary of Anne Frank, and A Boy's Life? The racist or fundamentalist parents of our students say that in a truly democratic society, the student should not be forced to read books by such people. Black people, Jewish people, homosexual people, and so on. They'll protest that these books are being jammed down their children's throats. I can't see how to reply to this charge without saying something like, there are credentials for admission to our democratic society, credentials which we liberals have been making steadily more stringent by doing our best to excommunicate racists, male chauvinists, homophobes, and so on. You have to be educated in order to be a citizen of our society, a participant in our conversation, someone with whom we can envisage merging our horizons. So we're going to go right on trying to discredit you in the eyes of your children, trying to strip your fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. We are not so inclusivist as to tolerate intolerance such as yours. I have no trouble offering this reply because I don't claim to make the distinction between education and conversation on the basis of anything except loyalty to a particular community. A community whose interests required re-educating the Hitler Youth in 1945 and re-educating the children of southwestern Virginia in 1996. I don't see anything Herrschaftsfrei about my handling of my fundamentalist students. <laughs> 
I think those students are lucky to find themselves under the hair shaft of people like me and to have escaped from their rather frightening and dangerous parents. So I think that the handling of such students is a problem for Putnam and Habermas. It seems to me that I'm just as provincial and contextualist as the Nazi teachers who made their students read their Sturme. The only difference is that I serve a better cause. I come from a better province. I recognize, of course, that domination-free communication is only a regulative ideal, never to be attained in practice. But unless a regulative ideal makes a difference to practice, it isn't good for much. So I ask, is there an ethics of discourse which lets me assign the books I want to assign, but makes no reference to the local and ethnocentric considerations which I should cite to justify my pedagogic practices? Can you get such an ethics out of the notions of reason, truth, and justification, or do you have to load the dies? Can I invoke universalistic notions in defense of my action as well as local ones? Like McIntyre, Ben Habib, Kelly, and others, I think that you have to smuggle some provinciality into your universals before they do you any good. We think this for the same sorts of reasons as Hegel thought you had to smuggle in some provinciality, some ethical substance, before you could get any use out of Kant's notion of unconditional moral obligation. In particular, you have to smuggle in some rule like no putative contribution to a conversation can be rejected simply because it comes from somebody who has some attribute which can vary independently of his or her opinions, an attribute like being Jewish or black or homosexual. I call this rule provincial because it violates the intuitions of a lot of people outside the province in which we heirs of the Enlightenment run the educational institutions. It violates what they would describe as their moral intuitions. I'm reluctant to admit that these are moral intuitions and should prefer to call them revolting prejudices. But I don't think that anything in the grammar of the term moral intuition or revolting prejudice helps us to reach agreement on this point, nor can I see that a theory of rationality. Abandoning the hopeless quest of how can philosophy find politically neutral premises premises which can be justified to anybody from which to infer an obligation to pursue democratic ethics. Dropping that question would let us admit, in Velmer's formula, that democratic and liberal principles define just one possible language game, among others. Such an admission would be in line with the Darwinian idea that the inclusivist project is no more rooted in something larger than itself than, say, the project of replacing ideographic by alphabetic writing or of representing three spatial dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. All three of these were good, immensely fruitful ideas, but none of them need universalistic backup. They can stand on their own feet. If we abandon the idea of philosophy which manages to be both politically neutral and politically relevant, we could start asking the question, given that we want to be ever more inclusivist, what should the public rhetoric of our society be like? How different should it be from the public rhetoric of previous societies? Habermas's implicit answer to this question is that we should hang on to a good many Kantian ideas about the connection between universality and moral obligation. Dewey, however, was willing to move much further away from Kant. Though he would heart have heartily agreed with Habermas that Aristotle's political vocabulary was unable to capture the spirit of democratic politics, he did not like the distinction between morality and prudence, which Habermas thinks essential, and on this point he would have thought Aristotle preferable. Dewey thought that the Kantian notion of unconditional obligation, like the notion of unconditionality itself, and of universality insofar as that idea is implicitly accompanied by that of unconditional necessity, could not survive Darwin. Whereas Habermas thinks that we need what he calls the reconstructive sciences designed to grasp universal competences in order to break out of what he calls the hermeneutic circle in which the Geisteswissenschaften as well as the interpretive social sciences are trapped, Dewey did not feel trapped. This was because he saw no need to resolve a tension between facticity and validity. He saw that tension as a philosopher's fiction, 
as a, resu a result of separating out, separating out two parts of a situation for no good, that is to say, no practical reason, and then complaining that they can't be put back together again. For him, all obligations were situational and conditional. This refusal to be unconditional led Dewey to be charged with relativism. If relativism just means failure to find a use for the, con for the notion of context-independent validity, then the charge was entirely justified. But no roads lead from this failure to an inability to engage in democratic politics unless one thinks that such politics require us to deny that, in Vilmer's formula, democratic and liberal principles define just one possible language game among others. The question about universality is for Dewey just the question of whether democratic politics can start from an affirmation rather than a denial of that claim. I don't think we can get much further in debating that question by talking about either modernity or reason. The question of whether Hegel should have stuck to the topic of reason by developing a theory of communicative reason, or should instead have dropped the topic and simply politicized philosophy, is not going to be settled by looking more closely at the grammar of words like true, rational, and argument. I'm referring here to a passage in Habermas's Philosophical Discourse of Modernity where he says, Hegel had this great opportunity. If he had gone on to become, let us say, Brandom and developed a theory of communicative reason, you know, he would have had it made, but because he was stuck with the philosophy of consciousness, he missed the chance, and we had to wait for another 150 years before Habermas and Brandom came along with a theory of communicative reason. <coughs> Neither is the question of whether philosophers like Annette Beyer are right in suggesting that we set, we set Kant aside and go back to Hume's attempt to describe reason in terms of conditioned sentiment rather than unconditional obligation. That is, you know, whether Beyer is right and her view of Kant isn't to be settled by thinking harder about what we mean by true, rational argument. But although we don't, if I'm right, need a theory of rationality, we do need a narrative of maturation. As I see it, the deepest disagreement between Habermas and myself is about whether the distinction between the unconditional and the conditional in general, and the distinction between morality and prudence in particular, is a mark of maturity or a transitional stage on the way to maturity. One of the many points on which Dewey agreed with Nietzsche was that it was the latter. Dewey thought that the desire for universality, unconditionality, and necessity was undesirable because it led one away from the practical problems of democratic politics into a never-never land of theory. Kant and Habermas think it's a desirable desire, one which one shares, only when one reaches the highest level of moral development. In this paper, I've tried to show how things look when one puts democratic politics in the context of Dewey's narrative of maturation. I can't offer anything remotely approaching a knockdown argument based on commonly accepted premises for this narrative. The best I could do by way of further defense of my view would be to tell a fuller story encompassing more topics in order to show how post-Nietzschean European philosophy looks from a Deweyan angle rather than a universalistic one. This is something I've tried to do in bits and pieces in various articles. I think that narratives are a perfectly fair means of persuasion and that Habermas's book, The Philosophical Discourse of Modernity, and Dewey's The Quest for Certainty, like, for example, Kant's uh, What is Enlightenment, and uh, Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history are both admirable illustrations of the power of narratives of maturation. My reasons for preferring Dewey's to Habermas's narrative are not that I think Dewey got truth and rationality right and that Habermas gets them wrong. I think that there's nothing to be gotten right or wrong here. At this level of abstraction, concepts like truth, rationality, and maturity are up for grabs. The only thing that matters is which way of reshaping them will, in the long run, make them more useful for democratic politics. Conce concepts are, as Wittgenstein taught us, uses of words. 
Philosophers have long wanted to understand concepts, but the point is to change them so as to make them serve our purposes better. Habermas's, Oppel's, Putnam's, and Vellmer's linguistification of Kantian concepts is one suggestion about how to make these Kantian concepts more useful. Dewey's and Davidson's thoroughgoing anti-Kantian naturalism is another suggestion. 